whatever you call it, I am running away from my responsibilities. Arm feels good. Hey, what's up everyone? It's Ryan here from The Y. And today, once again, we're gonna be taking a look at The Office. I think at this point, I've lost track of what rewatch I'm on now, but it's definitely the show that keeps on giving. And it seems like I'm not alone in this fact, as people still to this day are discovering new details about the show that lead to some pretty wild conclusions. So without further ado, here are three theories about The Office too good not to be true. In the aftermath of Michael Scott moving to Colorado, D'Angelo Vickers assumes the role of acting manager, much to the chagrin of Dwight. At first, Dwight's hurt by the fact that he wasn't considered for the position, and then when he finds out, Michael didn't even put in a recommendation. Get a recommendation from Michael. Can't you just use the recommendation you already have on file? What recommendation? The news absolutely crushes him. This theory by Primetime22 proposes that Michael Scott did put in a recommendation for one employee of Dunder Mifflin. It just wasn't Dwight, or Jim for that matter. I'll get to who that someone is in a bit, but first let's go over why it likely wasn't the two usual suspects. Starting off with Dwight, it's obvious there's no lack of passion on his part in wanting to become manager. However, that alone was not enough to convince Michael to recommend him. In Michael's eyes, Dwight was probably the best salesman at Dunder Mifflin's Granton and the branch would have been much worse off if they lost one of their top performers to a management role. But more importantly, Michael knew the personality of Dwight like the back of his hand and had a gut feeling it just wasn't conducive to being manager at that time. Dwight was stubborn, controlling, and in many ways craved power and authority. Why is my office black? To intimidate my subordinates. That's stupid. Traits that would make anyone skeptical of his leadership ability. And I believe Michael Scott thought all this through and knew there was a possibility that within a week, half of Dunder Mifflin Scranton might be fired if Dwight became manager. So he chose not to recommend him. In the case of Jim Halpert, Michael passed on recommending him because he already knew that Jim wanted to stay being a salesman to make more money. And he never saw Dunder Mifflin as a place he wanted to remain at forever. So it was probably far easier not to recommend Jim as opposed to Dwight. But if Michael didn't recommend Jim or Dwight to corporate, who did he think was best fit to replace him as regional manager of Dunder Mifflin's Granton? The answer is simple. In all his years overseeing the branch, there was one person who separated themselves in terms of ambition, leadership, and overall responsibility. And that person was Daryl Philbin. Next to Michael Scott himself, Daryl has the most leadership experience as he was the foreman of the warehouse for a long period of time. He's also a reasonable dude who everybody seems to get along with. And it's hard to imagine people having any problem if he were to assume the role. Not only that, but Daryl has already proven his usefulness to people higher up the ladder, namely Joe Bennett, when he proposes his idea for a new shipping plan. Maybe you should be doing your sketching upstairs. Do you like an office up here? Are you serious? In terms of the relationship between Michael and Daryl, Daryl didn't always act in his best interest. Did you already um, forward it to a whole bunch of people? Uh-huh. But when it really came down to it, he did things for Michael that only a true friend would. Sometimes when I'm down like this, it helps to sing the blues. And finally, the most bulletproof argument for why Michael recommended Daryl be the new manager of Dunder Mifflin's Granton is because he possibly hates Toby for screwing up his workers' comp claim. Assuming all this happened exactly as I explained, why was Daryl not promoted to regional manager after a sterling letter of rec from Michael? I think the answer to this question comes in the season 8 episode Lotto, where Andy says this. And here's the thing, you weren't even next in line. You have a history of being short with people, and you hired Glenn, your buddy, to replace you in the warehouse. He was underqualified. There's also the fact that back in season 2, Daryl led an attempt to unionize. And even though it was a while ago, corporate never really forgets something like that. Finally, Michael Scott's parting gifts to his employees provides all the evidence you'd ever need that he considered Daryl to be his protege. All of Michael's gifts in some way resemble what he feels each person needs. An example being, for Andy, he gives his 10 largest clients, hoping it will make him a better salesman. To Phyllis, he gives a chattering teeth gag, telling her to voice her opinion more. For Dwight, he gives a letter of recommendation to make up for the one he failed to give corporate earlier. And to Daryl, he gives his unfinished copy of Somehow I Manage, a guide to managing. Oh, is anybody here who can finish it? It's you. <laughs> That's sweet, Mike.
The next theory comes to us by way of Reddit user There But Not Yet and concerns the finances of Michael Scott. Of course, nobody truly knows how wealthy the world's best boss actually was, but if you take a look at a few key episodes, they definitely point to money problems. The first inkling of Michael's financial woes I can remember comes in the episode The Negotiation, where Daryl makes fun of Michael for barely making more than him. Oh, I'm sorry, Mike. Some more folks got to hear about this one. Ah. Okay. <laughs> then, in the aptly named episode 7 and 8 of season 4, Money, Michael Scott's dwindling finances are put on full display. It's shown that he's taken on a second job as a telemarketer to try and combat his heavy debt. He then declares bankruptcy. I declare bankruptcy! And finally, Michael and Oscar review his frivolous spending habits. Multiple magic sets, professional bass fishing equipment. How did you do this so fast? Is this... By now, it should be clear to everyone that Michael Scott was not well off, and you have to consider he might have been living paycheck to paycheck, which is why this next development is so perplexing. By the time season 7 comes around, Michael Scott's financial situation seems to have completely turned on its head. Instead of being worried about money, for the Christmas party, he offers to pay for everything himself. I want you to go and get a real tree. Get some money, thank you. Something that would have been impossible a few years ago. But the biggest signs of his newfound financial success revolve around Holly. Sure, if you were to tell me he was able to easily pay for an extravagant office party as he'd been better with his money for the past two years, it's not out of the question. But him being able to purchase a diamond ring that costs this much is a bit unbelievable. They say three years salary. And you also have to remember that Michael was giving up his job at Dunder Mifflin and moving to Colorado with Holly so she could care for her aging parents, all with no mention of a new job. So how could Michael Scott actually pull all this off? We know he can be stupid at times, but when it really comes down to it, he wouldn't set himself and his new wife up for failure with a couple of terrible financial decisions. The answer to all of these questions is actually hidden in Season 6, Episode 15, where David Wallace attempts to sell Michael Scott on the idea of Suck It. As you know, Scott declines, and this is his reaction. There are very few things that would make me not want to team up with David Wallace. And Suck It is one of them. So obviously, it looks as if Michael Scott had no interest whatsoever. But on second glance, this may not be the full truth. Based on what we know about Michael Scott, he's a good friend and a loyal man, almost to a fault. And although he acts like a petulant child at times, he would do anything to help out his close friends. Evidence of his kind-hearted nature is on full display in the episode Business School, where Michael is one of the only people to show up to Pam's art show and actually take an interest in her work. Additionally, when Ryan started up his website Wolf.com, Michael signed on as the main investor in the project, just based on blind faith in his friend. Circling back to David Wallace and Suck It, it's true that when Michael first heard about his new business idea, he was less than enthused. I think a big reason for this was that the whole thing was out of character for Wallace. I mean, you're talking about the former CFO who's now making a kid's toy called Suck It. It honestly sounds a lot like something Michael Scott would come up with as opposed to David Wallace. So even though his initial reaction was that of confusion, the more he thought about it, and after remembering back to all the times that Wallace was a true friend, I think Michael Scott reached out to him at a later date and invested in his company solely because he believed in David Wallace. And as you know, eventually David Wallace sells the patent for Suck It to the military for 20 million, leaving Michael Scott to walk away with a couple million himself. It would explain how he's able to purchase a diamond ring for somewhere in the neighborhood of $200,000, all the while not even batting an eye. And to top it all off, allows for him to quit his job at a moment's notice to move across the country with the woman he loves. If there is one thing you can say about David Wallace, it's that he's a nice guy. The amount of antics he lets Michael and the rest of Dunder Mifflin get away with is easily above and beyond what any normal boss would be willing to endure. You texted me, 911, call me, yes. all in caps. And this theory by Kentucky Wisdom says that because of his nice guy persona, he finds it extremely difficult to be the bearer of bad news. A surprising notion, especially considering the fact that he's the CFO of Dunder Mifflin, which is why he purposely uses Michael Scott to do the ugly parts of his job for him. In the final episode of Season 3, Michael, Jim, and Karen are interviewing for the position at corporate. At the conclusion of Michael's interview, he lets David know that he and Jan are back together. And this is David's response. I don't understand, so we're gonna tag team it? 
No, we're letting Jan go. Immediately after, Michael blabs to Jan about the news, and she blows up. Jan, this isn't the time. You're firing interview. me? Where the hell do you get off? And to be clear, I don't think David Wallace planned to use Michael Scott to break the bad news in this situation. That's sort of just how things worked out. However, what came out of this whole ordeal is the planting of the seed in David Wallace's mind that he could use Michael to do the same exact thing in the future. Cause let's be real, Michael Scott is the perfect ball guy. He can't keep a secret to save his life. Everyone here knows that I can't and won't keep a secret. Has very little to no awareness. It was like talking to the sweet old lady on the bus. And because of that, doesn't feel embarrassment like how a normal human would. Next, let's take a look at the final episode of season five, Company Picnic. Once again, David tells Michael a huge secret that the Buffalo branch is going to be shut down when he knows that he can't keep his mouth shut. I will say B, Buffalo, final answer. That is correct. What is he talking about? Really the most logical explanation why David would tell Michael something like this is that he was dreading doing it himself and was hoping that Michael would just blurt it out and get it over with. I have not seen this. I think David's thought process in doing all this is that it's easier to defend his position after the information's already leaked than to be the person who breaks the news in the first place. And you can see that even after the information's already out there, David still has a hard time confirming that is true. There have been talks about closing the Buffalo branch. And? We're, we're closing the Buffalo branch. Oh. It also doesn't make sense that Michael would still have a job if David Wallace was actually upset that he had leaked crucial company information. Then, in the season six episode, Shareholder Meeting, did you ever wonder why David thought it was a good idea to bring Michael Scott as his honored guest to the panel? He already knows how embarrassing and out of line Michael Scott can be so there must be some ulterior motive for inviting him. In my mind, it looks like a last ditch effort to save Dunder Mifflin by trying to force the other board members to see that the company is on its last legs. And this explains why David would say this. It was fun when we weren't on the brink of bankruptcy. We're going bankrupt, you think? <laughs> Two episodes after the shareholder meeting, Michael calls David and gets more than he bargained for. Listen, I shouldn't tell you this, but the company has a buyer board will have no choice but to approve and they are going to clean house. At this point, it's silly to think that he can keep his mouth shut about anything. But what's less clear is David's purpose in telling Michael this last piece of news. The most likely answer is that David's in such a habit of telling Michael the bad news to make him the fall guy. Listen, I shouldn't tell you this. Damn it, Michael. I told you that in confidence. David, I did not tell her. He does it again without thinking. This is the final time that he gives Michael the scoop as his second call reveals it is in actuality David who is going to be fired. You would think that this would be the last time that Michael Scott was used as the bearer of bad news, but you would be wrong. In the final episode of season six, things are still a mess at Dunder Mifflin, but under much different circumstances. Joe Bennett had now taken over the company and their main product, as I'm sure you remember, had become printers instead of paper. In Whistleblower, it's found that some of the Saber printers have a defect, causing them to catch on fire, and that someone at Dunder Mifflin Scranton leaked that information to the press. Joe Bennett goes on a sort of witch hunt to find the culprit, and eventually, Pam, Kelly, and Daryl confess to Michael that they may have been guilty of the press leak. All right, Michael, you need to convince Joe to go easy on us. So to save their jobs and appease his boss, Joe Bennett, Michael Scott agrees to be the fall guy one last time. Well, you know, I would be willing under the right circumstances to do that for you. And makes a public apology in place of her. We regret our slow response and our lapse in candor and judgment. Thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't forget to leave me a like and subscribe for more content like this. All right, till next time, have a great day.